Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our webinar, which will be presented by Dr. Coyote Coker with title Chemical Process Engineering Design, Analysis, Simulation, Integration and Problem Solving with um, Excel Unisim Software. I'm Zipeng from the University of Nottingham, Malaysia. It is my great pleasure to be the panelist for this webinar today. So this webinar is brought to you by the ICAMI Education Special Interest Group, um, or in short, we call it ACID. For your information, our Education Special Interest Group supports a network of chemical engineering educators around the world. This group aims to provide information exchange between the universities and industry, as well as to develop a network for, of interested and committed chemical engineers to share their expertise and ideas for the best practice in chemical engineering education. So although focused on undergraduate and postgraduate education, this is also involved in continuing education activities as well as promoting the profession in schools. So currently the SCT is chaired by Esther and um, Michaela is the vice chair. We also have SCT in Malaysia where the Malaysia chapters now is led by Dominic Fu. Can we go to the next slide, please, Dr. Kayori? So if you are interested to join um, us at the Education Special Interest Group, you can find us in the ICAMI website under the community, Communities and Special Interest Group. You just need to click the Join button. So next, point, next slide, please. So here I would like to take the opportunity to promote our next exciting event, which is the ChemEng Day UK that will take place on the 7th and 8th April. Um, this event is hosted by the University College London. So as part of the event, the ACID and the HCE UK are jointly organizing two workshops. First is um, on the design project workshop, which will happen on the 7th April. And the second um, will be the problem-based learning workshop um, on the 8th of April. So if you are interested, you can register for these workshops directly via the um, ACID um, events web page. So um, can you go to the next slide? So last but not least, if you are a participant from Malaysia, then you can consider to join us in the Exit Malaysia chapter. So you can contact um, Dominic uh, or myself, Zipeng or Julie Tan with the email address um, displaying on the slide um, now. So all right, that's all for the advertisement. So without further delay, I would like to pass the floor to our speaker today, Dr. Coyote. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Coyote Cocker is an engineering consultant for the AKC technology and also an honorary research fellow at the University of Wolverhampton. He has been an engineering coordinator at the Saudi Aramco um, Shell Refinery Companies, as well as the Chairman of the Department of Chemical Engineering Technology at the Jubal Industrial College, um, Saudi Arabia before this. So he is a chartered engineer uh, for more than 30 years. So in fact, he is a fellow of um, ICAMI and a senior member of the American Institute of Chemical Engineers. So Dr. Coyote has directed and conducted um, short courses extensively for some blue chip companies, um, such as the Aramco, Sabic, Procter & Gamble, and more. His articles has been published in several international journals with over 500 citations. Um, he is an author of um, seven books in chemical engineering, a contributor to the Encyclopedia of Chemical Processing and Design, and he is a certified twin, the mentor, mentor trainer. So he is also a technical report assessor and interviewer for the chartered um, chemical engineers in um, the ICAMI UK. Last but not least, he is a member of the International Biogra uh, Fico Centre in Cambridge. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, please welcome Dr. Coyote. Dr. Coyote, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Yunsai. Uh, Good morning to all participants in this webinar session for the from the four corners of the globe. I hope this webinar session will be informative and engaging. My first book was published nearly 30 years and at the time was the first book of its kind using Fortran programs for chemical process design, analysis and simulation. I had problems at the time with established publishing companies who declined to publish my book. 
because it wouldn't make any profit. But I persevered until two publishing companies in the States, Penwell and Gulf Publishing Companies, offered me a contract. Although I published articles in some well-known journals, such as Chemical Engineering Progress, The Chemical Engineer, Oil and Gas, which Penwell owns, I decided to opt for Gulf Publishing Company. The work took four years to complete, developing Fortran codes and extensive literature. These two volumes that you're seeing are an extension of this work suggested by Professor Ramat some five years ago. We again approached well-known publishers about our works for publication and wrote a proposal which was then reviewed by scholars from various universities as to their suitability for chemical engineering students, instructors, professors, chemical engineers, and professionals. However, all the reviewers provided positive feedback to the publisher, and although we were offered the contract, we decided to approach another company due to royalty issues and finally agreed with Scriven and Wiley publishers. Although publishers often advertise for would-be authors to write a book proposal, which is adequately vetted to meet publishers' uh, requirements, however, it's incumbent on authors to seek various alternatives of publishing their materials. This work is a culmination of five years of input developing Microsoft Excel spreadsheet in Unisem software for the examples and case studies, and extensive literature materials with new chapters on chemical kinetics, reactor design, and optimization, which we hope will enable readers to apply the contents to these volumes for to their problems. We also believe that these volumes are ideally suited for the 21st century and beyond. I'll strongly rec encourage instructors and university professors who are interested in writing books, in enhancing students' learning, to pursue their passions irrespective of their demanding research activities. Uh, I would like to thank my students in Saudi Arabia for their incredible contributions over the many years I was there and also the students at the University of uh, Wolverhampton that I'm um, a research, uh, honorary research fellow. The students have been incredible in their thoughts and help. The volumes are dedicated to chemical process engineers worldwide for using the resources of nature for the benefit of mankind. As you can see, these two volumes. I would like to express my thanks to IKMH Education interest, Special Interest Group, Gareth Jones, Dr. Sai, for hosting this webinar, and in particular to Professor Ramat, my co author, for suggesting this project some five years ago and his excellent cooperation for its uh, successful completion. Professor Ramat has a deep passion and commitment to enhance students' learning activities, and he was able to complete these volumes and other books during his sabbatical in 2021 at his former university in Montreal, Canada. Now, um, these are the two volumes, volumes one and two, um, comprising of uh, seven chapters. And uh, volume two of six chapters with an epilogue. Uh, reviews, which re reviews process simulation packages, classifying the most uh, useful software packages in chemical process engineering. It also provides uh, uh, cautions in using process simulators. However, uh, the well-known uh, chemical engineer and troubleshooter, uh, Mr. Norman Lieberman, often states that students and graduates in chemical engineering require to be on the field running performance tests and then interpret the results using technical education. He also advocates uh, graduates sh should learn from seasoned professionals to acquire adequate uh, proficiencies. Uh, these, uh, I also believe in this, uh, in this issue. 
back to spreadsheet. Um, spreadsheet started with Viscal for Apple in 1979, and then Lotus one two three um, by Lotus Corporation in 1983. And Microsoft Excel appeared two years later, which was then offered only for the Macintosh. However, in eight, later 1987, Microsoft ported Excel to the PC running on the Windows. Uh, in late uh, 1987, uh, Boland then introduced Quattro Pro for DOS in 1988, which is now sold by Corel. And those began a market struggle between Microsoft, Boland, and Lotus. Microsoft Excel is integrated in Microsoft Office and is now uh, widely recognized as the most versatile spreadsheet for problem solving, which enables chemical engineers to make computation and visualization in an easiest uh, possible way. And as we know, process engineers can use Excel for equipment sizing, process design, modeling, simulation, and optimization. And the Excel is also embedded in various simulation software where results can be imported into the Excel spreadsheet environment. Uh, the new Honeywell Unisim design, which is the R480 software, is a smart and intuitive uh, software. It creates thermodynamics and unit operation in steady state and dynamic models. Process simulation is a tool used to design a new process, an existing process, or the bottleneck uh, monitor, the process conditions, troubleshooting, and optimize uh, uh, and enhance throughput. And as uh, in, the, in the States, Professor David Clough from the University of Colorado has published articles in CAP on the use of Excel spreadsheet for chemical engineering solving problems and also he has provided AIC courses as well. Others have also written um, articles on the use of uh, uh, Excel in solving chemical engineering problems. Uh, and uh, these are my two books. The Fortran program, as you could see on the left, was published nearly uh, 30 years ago, uh, on which the two volumes are based and, and is extensively reviewed. And uh, this was published uh, 21 years ago. Uh, they use uh, five one quarter floppy disk. Uh, and as you can see in those days, um, uh, they still use slide rule with IBM computers. And um, again, uh, punch cards um, for coding and uh, HP calculators, programmable calculators. Um, and uh, Texas uh, calculator. And uh, this is the uh, ICL mainframe, which is then used in those days in the, in the 60s, 70s. And um, uh, things have evolved since then. And uh, my presentation will be on these two, on these two volumes are actually, uh, is actually referred to flow sheeting and process safety which uh, chemical process engineers are involving in the chemical process industries. And uh, the chemical engineer, oops, uh, is a branch, uh, chemical engineering is a branch of chemical, uh, is a branch uh, or, uh, in that uh, natu or involves natural sciences, chemistry, life sciences, biology, and uh, mathematics, uh, economics, uh, production, transformation, uh, and it involves proper usage of um, materials and energy. And more than chemical engineers are concerned with processes which convert raw materials uh, into useful products. And they're also concerned with pioneering valuable materials related to techniques, which are often essential to related fields such as nanotechnology, fuel cells and bioengineering. And um, I'm trying to see if I could minimize this. Uh, if we look at this spreadsheet here, I mean, the, this slide, 
there's a raw material, there's a general flow diagram of a chemical process and a hierarchy in process design, whereby we, oops, yeah, whereby we've got a, a raw material going through to a chemical process, and the, the chemical process is to convert the raw materials into products. And um, of course, we've got A, B, and CD, AB are the raw materials, CDs are the products and the byproducts. The unreacted raw materials, which goes through a separation process and a purification, uh, could involve distillation, extraction, uh, these various types of unit operations in the separation of the raw materials. Uh, in, um, then having the product, which is a, a byproduct of C and the main product uh, uh, F. The unreacted raw materials are then fed back to the chemical process. And in the chemical process is where we have um, uh, chemical rea reactions. And these will take place in reactors such as batch, continuous steel tank, block flow, fixed bed, fluidized bed, uh, loop reactors, and so on. Here, it's, uh, that's the cross of the matter of a chemical engineer, um, whereby it will involve a heat input into the chemical process. If that reaction requires heat, it means that uh, the thermodynamics in that reaction is an endothermic. And uh, of course, heat input is in uh, place. Uh, however, uh, if it is taken out, it means that the reaction is exothermic. And uh, uh, we need to be cautious of how we control the, the process in terms of temperature pressure controls. And um, the reaction kinetics is also very involving uh, with chemical engineers. Here we have A and B going to C and D is a, a second order reaction. We could add different types of reactions, and uh, such as uh, um, uh, competing reactions, um, um, parallel reactions. And in this case, I'm trying to see what's happening here. Um, oh, good. Right. Uh, um, in, in the case of a series reaction, it could involve um, ethanol, which is then um, having to uh, dehydrogenate or yeah, to aldehyde and then ox oxygenate the aldehyde to um, 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 acetic acid. So that is a typical series reaction. Uh, it is a typical reaction here, which involves uh, um, um, benzene and ethylene to form an intermediate. So these are uh, uh, um, a, uh, uh, two reactants to form an intermediate, ethyl benzene. And of course, we require to understand the rate of reactions taking place. And as we know that the, for, uh, the, uh, the rate of reaction increases for every increase, uh, twice that of the temperature where every degree in temperature is that it increases twice. And of course, we have the healthy benzene, which is then giving us uh, these two uh, products. One is styrene and the other is hydrogen. Here we have uh, an equilibrium uh, case whereby healthy benzene is then being dehydrogenated to form this product, but at the same time, this styrene is then reversed back to ethyl benzene, which involves uh, controlling some parameters. So if we were to lower the pressure here in the formation of the ethyl benzene, we'll get more of the styrene in which it then goes in a forward direction. And of course, these require um, us to understand the kinetics, the mechanism taking place, as well as uh, the safety issues. And again, uh, safety data sheets, material safety data sheets for all these relating to the safe operation um, is, is required. 
And the hierarchy of this involves the reactor, which is inside the chemical process, and the heat balance is just, this is just like an onion shape, uh, and the heat balance going from the reactor to the separator, which is the separation uh, process here, <clears throat> involves the heat and material balances uh, at, the, at the boundary. And of course, from there, we've got the heat exchanger network involving the, the targets uh, of utilities for either the cooling and eating duties. And we'll resolve to this uh, later on. Right, uh, uh, this is a photo of a petrochemical refinery uh, showing various columns. And it's a very complex uh, uh, unit, uh, the petro uh, refining units. You've got, you've got the crude distillation unit, you've got the catalytic cracking unit in the refinery, as well as the reforming units. And of course, the crude will come in at um, uh, either it's paraffinic, naphthenic, or uh, aromatic types of crudes. And uh, depending on the crudes, you will need to be able to separate into different fractions in these various units uh, in, in the refining. And we'll talk a little bit more on this later on. Uh, this also shows a refinery with uh, uh, various piping network and storage tanks. So this is a, a, a simple distillation diagram, um, which involves uh, two laws and in these laws we have the Rouse law and Dalton's law and in Dalton's law we're able to determine the equilibrium uh, constants and we can relate this to the relative volatility which involves the vapor pressure of the light component ratio of the vapor pressure of the light component to that of the uh, heavy component and of course we'll be able to understand the thermodynamics of this and in understanding the thermodynamics we can then go ahead to determine um, the number of trays in the column the calculate the head for the reboiler in the column the condensers and the, the reflux as well from this parameter and of course this will involve uh, the simulation and there is a typical diagram of uh, simulation in of, of a distillation column uh, here we've got uh, a fluidized bed catalytic cracking unit and uh, of course uh, it uh, takes its feed from the uh, atmospheric distillation which is the bottom of the atmospheric distillation unit from the vacuum unit uh, which uh, the, the heavy gas oil like gas oil and also from the coker unit and often what happens here is uh, along the riser with the catalyst being fed at a high temperature it breaks the long chains of these uh, into smaller chains. This is where the cracking process takes place uh, involving the catalyst and the residence time is quite fast. And uh, you can see that the high temperature in the reactor, it's got its uh, um, uh, cyclones whereby it then separates uh, the, uh, the catalyst um, and the vapor uh, is fed through the top to the fractionator units and it's got various uh, uh, um, valves and of course we've got the spent catalyst that is then returned to a regenerator and um, to burn off uh, the uh, the co coke formation which is uh, poisoned and in some cases uh, by uh, sulfur in, in in the coke and then the this spent catalyst is then regenerated with uh, air at high temperature and is then fed back into the riser and the flue gas escapes at the top is gone through an electrostatic uh, precipitator for separation and of course here we've got different valves and, uh, and uh, instrument systems that we need to take care of 
and we've got the light gases, the laughter, heavy gases, and light cycle. And um, the control valve is uh, 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 an instrument um, which uh, helps to control the, the, the flow of fluid at varying sizes uh, or flow passage, which is directed uh, by a signal from the controller. And what we have is that this enables the direction of flow um, um, and the consequent control process, uh, such as pressure, temperature, and liquid level. So after knowing all this, we'll be able to determine uh, the control valve coefficient. And uh, again, we should be careful of uh, choke flow. And we know that uh, it's, a, it's a limiting condition where the mass flow uh, doesn't increase where, with a further decrease in, in the downstream pressure uh, for a fixed uh, pressure and temperature. And uh, again, for gases, the mass flow rate is independent of the downstream pressure. Um, and, uh, and depends only on the temperature and pressure and hence the density of the gas on the upstream side of the restrictions uh, 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 of, of the valve. Uh, uh, so, uh, and for liquid, the li restriction in the valve causes a decrease in liquid pressure beyond the, the restriction uh, below which uh, the liquid vaporizes uh, at operating conditions. So we should be careful of shock flow and uh, otherwise we'll have uh, partial uh, uh, flash and bubbles of vapor, which will subsequently collapse uh, the bubbles and causes uh, cavitation. And these are the various uh, procedures uh, to calculate uh, the sizing of uh, a valve uh, based on the pressure drop, knowing the flow in the line. Of course, we know to, uh, to find out uh, the pressure drop of the, of the valve, um, on, on the system or from the system. And again, we should check that the flow uh, is not choked, as the case may be. Uh, these are sizing criteria um, uh, for uh, sizing the control valve um, for these different services, whether it's uh, critical, non critical, <clears throat> uh, partial ca cavitation taking place maximum. So we have the various. Uh, uh, velocities and uh, which uh, should be within certain ranges and of course for gases uh, it shouldn't get to sonic uh, condition which is one and you could see here it should be less than 0.7 for intermediate uh, gas services uh, for relief valve again uh, the, the basis of the relief valve is to uh, control um, it, for over pressure of of the of the vessels and this is a typical relief valve uh, in photo and uh, again uh, it gives us uh, a, um, a flow diagram of uh, defining protective uh, system where to locate the devices and we need to define the over pressure scenarios for relief valves and then uh, this, also have to be able to choose the relief valve types um, and acquire the necessary data. And in that, whether it's a single phase flow or two phase flow, and there are different uh, parameters we need to consider. If it's a, a single phase, whether it's liquid, whether it's for fire relief or vapor relief. And if it's a two phase, it's a, a gaseous phase and, uh, and vapor phase type. And all these are actually in the book in terms of determining the various uh, uh, sizes for these two uh, um, phases. And then we specify the design basis, we design the relief valves, which will ensure that the relief valve um, or, um, orifice uh, is uh, at the right size. And uh, of course, uh, these are the various uh, conditions whereby we determine the, uh, the, re the relief scenarios, whether it's a blocked in uh, scenario and uh, an overpressure, malfunction of the valve and, and so on, uh, failure, air failure. And of course, this uh, a relief uh, valve uh, data sheets in whereby we then determine the area of the valve. 
and uh, we write down uh, after going through the various calculations this will be checked by a senior engineer approved by the manager to ensure that you've, uh, the junior engineer has actually determined the right size of the valve. Um, again, uh, this is a typical uh, relief system such that the inlet of the valve here, uh, determined by the engineer, is less than 3% of the set pressure. The outlet is less than 10% uh, of the set pressure in gauge. And uh, these are typical design equations. All, all these are in the book and determining uh, the relief sizing uh, for the relief valve. Uh, again, here we've got uh, uh, different types of uh, batch reactors um, for um, um, determining uh, the reactants going into a batch system. And we have uh, different scale of batch reactors uh, from lab scales into a full scale batch reactors. And they also determining uh, the, the time taken um, for either cooling or eating various stages in the batch reactor. Um, uh, mathematical models and uh, design equations of all these various conditions are in the book. Uh, which uh, the user can easily get and again um, uh, express checks and uh, spreadsheet software um, of all these various uh, conditions are also in the book. Um, this is a, a continuous steer tank um, whereby uh, um, the reactants are fed in continuously from one to another and until we get our product and um, again, uh, this is a new chapter in the book relating to um, reactor design and kinetics. Uh, this uh, shows a typical uh, polyethylene, whereby the reactor technology involves uh, uh, ethylene and uh, propylene polymerization, which is highly exothermic. And in this, we should be able to control the reactors um, because if the rate of removal is not being controlled in such that the rate of each generation in the reaction system exceeds that of the removal, we could possibly lead to a runaway reaction. And this will need to be controlled. And of course, uh, process control temperature also avoiding hot spots. Uh, here uh, with the catalyst, which is being fed, uh, the reaction actually is being dictated by the catalyst uh, in the polymerization. These are typical loop reactors, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is also um, uh, expressed and defined in the book. And this is a plug flow reactor with series. And uh, we've got packed bed reactors as well, which is uh, well defined. And uh, as we as I said earlier on, in catalytic reactors, we've got the risers, uh, we've got the products, uh, and the products are fed through to the distillation column, uh, and the spent catalyst is then being regenerated in the regenerator, which here being blown, and the flue gas. And uh, there are various courses in cooling uh, um, reactors, which could lead to uh, consequences of runaway reactions. And um, these need to be really controlled in, in terms of uh, the various things that could happen, so, such as loss of uh, agitation, loss of cooling, overcharge of reactants. And uh, these are the various conditions that we need to take on board. Uh, an example of this is what happened in, uh, in two T2 laboratories in a runaway reaction incident. Uh, and I'd like to show you a video on, on this of what happened.
on December 19, 2007, a powerful explosion and fire occurred at T2 Laboratories, a small chemical producer in Jacksonville, Florida. The blast killed and injured workers, destroyed T2 Laboratories, and extensively damaged four nearby businesses. Windows blew into offices, striking workers with flying glass. The explosion at T2 Laboratories is one of several accidents that the CSB has investigated caused by runaway chemical reactions. Accidents resulting from reactive hazards occur too frequently and often have serious consequences. Behind me on this concrete pad, there used to stand a structure some 50 feet high that had a reactor vessel in it, in which the company that operated here, T2 Laboratories Incorporated, manufactured a chemical known as methylcyclopentadienyl manganese tricarbonyl, or MCMT for short. The entire structure and reactor vessel were blown away in the explosion. T2 produced MCMT, a gasoline additive, in batches using a 2,500 gallon reactor. An operator controlled the process with a computerized system in a nearby control room. In the first step, liquid chemicals and sodium metal were loaded into the reactor, heated, and then mixed with an agitator. The reaction produced hydrogen, which was vented to the atmosphere. In normal operations, when the temperature reached 300 degrees Fahrenheit, the operator would turn off the heating system. But because this reaction was exothermic or heat producing, the temperature inside the reactor would continue to rise. At 360 degrees, operators would begin to periodically fill the reactor's cooling jacket with water. As the water boiled, heat was removed, controlling the temperature. However, on the day of the accident, the CSB found that the operator tried to cool the reactor as usual, but the cooling system likely malfunctioned, perhaps due to a blockage in the water supply piping or a valve failure. The temperature and pressure inside the reactor began to rise uncontrollably in a runaway chemical reaction. T2's co-owners returned to the plant after a worker called to report the cooling problem. While one owner searched for the plant mechanic, the other went to the control room. Concerned about a possible fire, he warned employees to move away from the reactor. Inside the reactor, the pressure was still increasing, reaching 400 pounds per square inch and boosting the rupture disc. Witnesses heard a sound like a jet engine as high pressure gas began to vent from the reactor. But it was too late. Within 10 seconds, there was a massive explosion, equivalent to about 1,400 pounds of TNT. The blast damaged buildings over 1,500 feet away. Debris rocketed up to a mile. The co-owner and the operator in the control room were killed. Two operators further away died from flying debris. 32 other people were injured, including 28 at nearby businesses. This facility uh, housed multiple types of chemicals. It was a kind of a mass storage of everything you can think of, and it was all mixed together and it was all burning together. And for our perspective from, from the hazardous material side, it makes kind of a worst case scenario. Damage from the explosion was so severe, four nearby buildings were condemned. My office personnel um, heard a whistling sound in the area. And as they looked out the window, uh, they saw an orange glow, which was the uh, blast coming off of the explosion. And it came to our offices and it blew in all the windows in our office traders. Immediately, it was a shock or a surprise. And then all of us were shaking afterward.
right. So uh, this actually what's happened uh, with uh, on con uh, a runaway reaction, and it could be quite devastating. Um, here is a photo of refinery and chemical plants uh, with uh, uh, isometrics obtained by CAD, computed aided diagram. And <clears throat> this photo of uh, uh, a segment of a plant, uh, of, of a pipe with various bends. And uh, an example is to, to determine the pressure loss, as it were, uh, of a given fluid, an incompressible fluid in the pipe, given all these various conditions. And of course, in determining the pressure drop, which should be uh, less than the available pressure drop in the pipe, we need, need all these various uh, um, um, conditions, such as determining the Reynolds number, uh, the friction factor, which we know is relating to the, uh, the resistance of flow <clears throat> involving the shear stress and the kinetic energy. And the friction factor will be dependent on the uh, roughness and the diameter of the pipe. And this will enable us to determine the frictional pressure drop from that equation. And then we we'll check whether the calculated is against the specified pressure drop if it is, then we've arrived at a given uh, determined uh, solution. If not, then we'll need to either um, increase uh, the diameter of the pipe. And there's a rule of thumb as well that uh, from this equation that the pressure drop is uh, inverse is directly proportional to the square root or um, the square of the velocity in the <clears throat> of the fluid uh, is inversely proportional to the uh, the diameter to the fifth power of the pipe and it's linearly proportional there to the length of the pipe. So th that's uh, um, and is a, a typical um, um, uh, uh, cold brill white um, diagram involving the laminar flow for different Reynolds number and we have the relative uh, roughness which is uh, the ratio of uh, the pipe uh, roughness to the diameter um, with each uh, Reynolds uh, at varying Reynolds number we can determine the friction factor and the different types of friction factor which is the Darcy friction factor as well as the uh, Fanning friction factor and uh, we know that the Darcy friction factor is four times uh, the Fanning friction factor or the Chen friction factor and these are uh, the, the the one here is the Colebrook White implicit equation, and again uh, this is uh, an example of this is given in the book, whereby um, we could have an iteration um, to determine the friction factor for the of of the of the pipe, and um, this is a direct equation which is explicit uh, using the Chen's equation. And there are all the various fittings, and in the fittings we can also incorporate the different types of fittings. Uh, and of course, the Crane Technical re Report uh, uses the equivalent length to, to determine the uh, 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 resistance uh, coefficient. There are all the two methods now, which is the there's the 2K method by Upas, and there's also the 3K method by uh, Darby. Uh, but uh, and, and we can incorporate these various four different types of fittings to determine the uh, the pressure loss in the pipe, uh, 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 whereby the the restrictions to various fittings are, um, are incorporated in in this equation here. Uh, again, for centrifugal pump, as you saw earlier on, this is a, a photo of a centrifugal pump and pumping fluid which goes uh, in, from um, a source. This is actually attached to uh, um, uh, a distillation column in the refinery. Um, we should be able to uh, determine the um, power for the pump and there is a pump calculation sheet whereby knowing all the various temperatures uh, or the temperature, uh, the, the specific gravity, we can go through all these to determine the, uh, the pressure loss between the discharge and the suction pressure 
and then determine the, the power requirement if we know the pump efficiency. And again, we should take care that we do not cavitate, that the, uh, the uh, pump does not have uh, a high vapor pressure in, of the fluid at that temperature, leading to cavitation, because uh, that could uh, involve uh, um, problems in, 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 the, in, in the pump itself. Um, so um, cavitation has to be taken care of, and that is obtained by determining the net positive suction head. And Lieberman states here uh, that, uh, uh, as he states, uh, it should be doubled or 10 times greater than the required net positive suction head from that equation. So this is uh, his statement here in determining the, the relationship between the required positive suction head and the available so, uh, uh, positive suction head. Uh, this is a diagram of a two-phase flow for horizontal piping involving different uh, patterns. And uh, again, we can then determine these various param parameters for the two-phase flow to determine whether uh, it falls within these various conditions. Moreover, we should ensure that we do not get slope flow, and slope flow can actually damage the pipe due to vibrations and so on. Uh, there's a, a diagram of a shell and two beat exchanger. Um, all these are well um, explained and design equations for all the different types of heat exchangers uh, in the book, in the two volumes. And this is a, a specification flow sheet for the two, uh, for the exchanger. Uh, there's a design parameters relating to the design conditions. And, and this is what uh, a, a, an engineer requires uh, in the design process and obtaining the design specification, the concept, in calculating the economics. Also in the book, there's a detailed chapter on this in the book, the detailed design selections, procurement, and, and so on. And of course, in design objectives, these are the things we need to understand. Uh, the, the development uh, and the modification of an existing plan and, uh, and uh, knowing um, what's required. And of course, there is a design uh, features, the purpose, the design summary, and this will involve in, uh, the process flow diagram, the PNID, the mass and energy balance, and uh, of course, quotations will need to be uh, obtained and will relate to the various uh, uh, other departments, instrument, mechanical, civil, electrical, as the case may be. And again, we ought to take into consideration the ASOP hazard studies in the design philosophy, and that will relate to the and the various parameters, whether it's in flow, uh, pressure, temperature, uh, for the key in the ASOP studies. And there are other studies which required in process uh, and, uh, safety process uh, management, such, such as the 4 tree, uh, the failure mode effect analysis, and these, uh, the layer of protection analysis as well. Uh, this is a typical design cycle um, from feasibility studies going through the various process design bases, uh, the feed, and to detailed design, uh, troubleshooting, and so on. And uh, of course, uh, we need to bear in mind the inherent design uh, safety issues, minimizing, uh, substituting, moderate, simplify as the case may be and the various design uh, administrations uh, in these design uh, regions. Um, and of course, uh, the design codes from the ASME, uh, API, BS uh, standards. And these are incorporated in the various uh, uh, these uh, regions of the designs uh, by an engineer. Uh, flow sheets, uh, the arrangement um, in, in terms of the flow, um, compositions, operating conditions. Uh, this will involve the block diagram, which represents uh, a simplified form, and they're not detailed um, in, in the block diagram. It's only showing what's going in, coming out, 
and uh, there is a typical uh, block diagram of a crude of a, a refinery unit with the crude going through the various uh, aspects such as the crude distillation unit we've got the vacuum unit uh, whereby we've got in uh, the bottom from the crude distillation goes through the vacuum unit and of course there is no uh, cracking in this unit you only reducing the pressure uh, and to get more of the products out uh, to all these various units here. Uh, of course, uh, we know the um, incident that happened um, in BP, in which then seventeen contractors were killed involving the isomerization unit. Uh, in the hydro treating unit of uh, this uh, uh, refining, what basically happens is we're trying to remove the sulfur, nitrogen, hydrogen, which have been converted into uh, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, and steam, and as well uh, the saturations of the aromatics, such as uh, benzene converted into naphthalene, and the ethylene from the cracking unit has been converted into a, a paraffin. And, an example that took place here in the hydro treating uh, unit, uh, which is in uh, Tesoro, uh, um, Narcotis refinery, uh, involves a high temperature temp um, uh, hydrogen attack, whereby if the metal is not really obtained properly, in the case of this uh, uh, incident, which killed uh, seven people, the heat exchanger was made of carbon steel. And when the, I, because what's happening here in the hydro treating is that hydrogen is added um, uh, to the unit where the, the naphtha is then converted into various products, the hydrogen actually attacks uh, the uh, carbon in the heat exchanges, turning the carbon um, the, um, into methane, and methane then actually increased in the heat exchanges, which led to this uh, phenomena, uh, which is the uh, temperature hydrogen attack. And it created the fissures, it exploded, and it uh, killed uh, seven uh, uh, personnel. You can check that using this uh, on the, from, from the website. Uh, the PNIFD uh, is uh, again uh, relating to the process conditions, heat balance, and uh, there's a, a PNID of uh, a distillation unit with the Kero stripper, the debutanizer, the vacuum, and the waste heat. Um, of course, what we have in the PNID is the equipment, uh, uh, the line sizing, um, the fittings, the pumps. And these are the various things in the PNID, uh, which uh, uh, because uh, we need to take into consideration, um, in, such as uh, the tag number, the duties, if it were exchanges, uh, and, and so on uh, for PNID. Uh, these are uh, a typical. Uh, diagram of a PNID involving the various controls uh, and the relief valves and the uh, indicators. Uh, finally, going to pinch technology, what we have here is um, the major of uh, goals of pinch is targeting and optimizing heat exchanges, designing optimum heat exchanges optimizing the utilities and revamping. And uh, we have the source um, and the, uh, the the target, which is trying to maintain uh, the minimum utility there, and the core target. And we're trying to obtain uh, the, the pinch between the off stream, which is, so it's, uh, it's cooling and the cold stream, which is eating. There is an overlap between the hot and the cold stream, and we can determine that from the entropy temperature diagram. And uh, this is a typical uh, sketch of uh, the uh, streams, whereby it's not 
uh, integrated yet, having a, a cost operation of that amount and the capital cost of that amount. However, when a pinch um, integration is now being implemented, we have the, to reduce the cost to this amount as well as the capital. And the, that's showing the block diagram of the pinch approach. Uh, the prop, the prop, and the situation with uh, uh, it has changed is that we should have no utilities uh, below the, the pinch and no cold utilities above the pinch. And again, there's no transfer of water and between the pinch. That is essential. And this relates to what we have with the minimum uh, eating cooling external and the maximum, the overlap is where we have the maximum amount of heat recovery. And then again, uh, here what we have is to have the cost relating to the energy cost, the capital cost, and the total cost. And uh, the delta P is the minimum allowed temperature difference, uh, whereby it reduces the exchange area with the increase in the minimum. It also reduces the heat recovery between the old and cold uh, composite curves, uh, <clears throat> curves, and it increases the heat cost as well. It also increases the consumption of heat and cooling duties. And the best way is to have the optimum, uh, if we choose the optimum well, we'll be able to um, play around and get uh, the good capital and energy costs. Uh, in a typical that, um, <clears throat> example here is what we have with those streams, supply streams of uh, hot and cold, and we can construct a, a problem um, table, pinch, and then determining uh, the maximum energy recovery at these temperatures. So we've got the supply temperature, we've got the target, we've got the heat duty, we can determine the heat capacity. And if we use uh, this spreadsheet, um, whereby we can then, it gives us a, a problem a table, and we know our pinch, at that, we can determine the hot pinch and cold uh, pinch. It also determines the hot and cold utilities. It signifies as a single pinch. And is, uh, it also gives us a, a diagram of the hot and cold composite curves, uh, variations of the global. And we can determine our heat exchanger network. And here for uh, a temperature of um, delta T. The, these are the various conditions that are above the pinch, these, and below the pinch, the heat capacity and the number should be greater. And we should design our heat exchanges away from this uh, uh, pinch. And of course, we have an, a maximum heat recovery for a minimum temperature there. You can see it increases. However, the odd utility requirements are reduced as the increase in temperatures. You can see here that uh, the maximum heat recovery here is lower than that uh, at 10 degrees. However, here the odd utility requirement as and also the cold utility requirement uh, have actually increased from 600 to 1000 from 400 to 800 uh, kilowatts. And uh, the conclusion here is that uh, the, the book actually is it's an hands on guide um, for chemical process engineers. It uh, assists engineers in analyzing problems, it provides uh, design manuals to methods and proven fundamentals. Uh, it's also, uh, you have incredible case studies in the book. Um, as I said, uh, volume one is over 500 with various design equations um, and uh, literatures, and it helps to optimize, uh, um, uh, achieves optimum operations and process design. And um, I'd like to thank uh, ICAMENG and uh, you guys for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Kayudi, for the very insightful presentation. I believe um, the audience have gained much from your experience and expert, um, expertise sharing. So for the participants, um, if you have any question, um, you can type um, the question in the chat box and I will read to Dr. Kayudi. I understand that um, actually we are supposed to be the end of um, the, the, the webinar, but um, um, let so wait for a few minutes if you have a um, question, then probably we can um, um, answer one or two questions um, then um, before we end the session. Um, Dr. Kayuri, there is a request. Um, it says that can we have a look or quick demo on the Excel Unisim software? Uh, well, this will, uh, what we'll require for this now is uh, um, to request this from the publisher because uh, what happens now is that uh, we don't have any more control. All, all, all the copyrights are now with the publisher. So uh, I'll encourage and advise all um, listeners and participants uh, to write to the publisher. Wiley uh, for this uh, um, uh, software. Uh, again, once a, 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 an author finishes and it signs all, all, all the various copyrights, uh, then uh, he or she is now limited by what uh, he or she can do, by the way. Uh, but uh, my advice is for participants to write to the publishers uh, for, for the um, Excel uh, software. But the, the, the two volumes are well detailed. They took us uh, five years and uh, uh, we believe uh, they're, they're well comprehensive indeed. Yes, actually, personally, I also have the same request. It's very curious. Uh, I mean, it's very um, you know, uh, uh, curious to look at um, the, the Excel Unisim software. <laughs> but anyway, I think um, it will publish in um, April, what I understand. That yeah, it's a, a, the, the, what we also are urging uh, the publishers uh, is to make uh, uh, paperback copies uh, for for students uh, because uh, we believe that these two volumes will will really help students worldwide in, in their design and, uh, projects, as it were. And uh, if uh, what the publishers did promise us is that let's publish the add back once they've been published and then uh, they will review publishing the paperback but uh, we'll insist uh, that uh, we'll urge them put it that way we'll urge them to please pop, uh, go on to publish the paperbacks uh, for students worldwide so that they can have uh, copies of this and of course yes. uh, they'll be able to access the um, the website for the various excel uh, um, ex exercises Yes, that will be very helpful. Um, one more question, maybe before we end. Um, there is a question asking, how do we deal with um, reactor designs when it is difficult to find kinetics data on the reactions? Well, uh, this is where studies of kinetic studies will have to be taken into consideration uh, because in, in, in any reactor designs, uh, really the first input is to find uh, carry out some various kinetic uh, mechanisms and, and of course uh, the modeling before going to how a, a reactor can be designed uh, it, it, it's, it's, it, of course you can then go on to review some various design processes uh, but again this will be at the discretions of uh, the, the uh, the organizations or the companies as well. Uh, they, by and large, what I do know is that um, research work uh, is always being conducted and uh, various publications have been provided in various design methodologies. Uh, but uh, I believe, firstly, you need to obtain the various kinetics uh, in the mechanism in which you want to design your reactors. I hope that uh, gives us some sort of an answer to the, the to the question. All right. Um, 
probably um, we take this um, the last one. Um, what are the possible limitations of the Excel Unisim software? Sorry, say that again. Is that, what are the what are the possible limitations of um, the Excel so, uh, the Excel Unisim software? Well, the, 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 of course, uh, no software is ever perfect. Uh, there, there will be limitations whereby you then go into um, uh, uh, where they're relating to modeling, in-depth modeling. And, but it, it carries out the various basic calculations required by engineers on the fields. Uh, yes, there are limitations. What are they? Um, detailed um, calculations. And again, this is where we've now incorporated the Unison design software. So it, that also complements the Excel in our book. Um, to uh, to relate to how a detailed design is being constructed. There are limitations in various uh, packages, by the way, and uh, we, deter we we stated that in the epilogue uh, in the book as well. The limitations of the various uh, packages, um, both uh, the uh, simulators. Um, you could talk of MATLAB and all the various other types, I mean, MATCAD, uh, each one has its own limitations, by the way. Um, but um, this is where, can, but basically we've, we feel that Excel is easily accessible to uh, everyone all over the world uh, as compared to having to purchase a simulator package. And uh, yes, there'll be limitations. We, complemented this with the use of Unison design as well. Okay, understand. All right, so I get um, there is no more question, but um, there are a few compliments for you, um, Dr. Coyote. Um, thanks for the nice presentation and also the wonderful um, efforts for all this work. So I guess um, that's um, come to the end of um, this webinar. Thank you everyone for joining us um, today. So before um, we end here, so I wish um, everybody have a pleasant day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.